Good morning and welcome to Davos. My name is Jim Frederick, and I'm the international editor at Time Magazine. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to one of the kickoff sessions of the 2012 World Economic Forum in Davos. As you all know, Davos is a forum where some of the world's most distinguished minds come together to discuss the world's biggest, broadest, and most pressing problems. And I think as this past year has shown, some of the problems we are facing today are more pressing than they have been in a long, long time. As a bit of a departure, and in an attempt to foster a more spirited discourse, the World Economic Forum and Time have framed today's panel as a debate, centered on discussing the premise, is 20th century capitalism failing 21st century society? This morning, I'm honored to be flanked by some of the finest minds who have convened here today to help us get some traction on these issues. In alphabetical order, but not necessarily in seating order, we have Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. We have Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America. We have Raghu Rajan, the Eric G. Gleacher Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. We have David Rubenstein, co-founder and managing director of the Carlyle Group, and Ben Vervan, CEO of Alcatel Lucent. And my thanks to all of you for joining us. So some specifics about how we're going to run this morning. In keeping with the spirit of an Oxford-style debate, I'm going to begin soon with a vote uh, that I will throw out to the audience about whether they agree, disagree, or are undecided about the resolution that 20th century capitalism is failing 21st century society. And then, because I don't really think that a five-part, uh, that Oxford-style debates are not really designed to be answered in turn by five people, and I think it would get quite tiresome if we went all the way down the line, do you think this is true, do you think this is true? Uh, I'm going to break the session up into smaller, more generalized mini postulates to see if our panelists will be willing to take positions before or against. After a couple rounds of that, we'll have some more info to see where our panelists stand. Um, I might have some follow-up questions. And then with anywhere between 20 to 25 minutes to go, I can open the panel all up to questions from the audience. And finally, with only about you know, two, three minutes to go, We'll close the session with another round of voting to see if anybody in the audience has changed their position on whether or not they think in Oxford-style debate style that they think that 20, 20th century capitalism has failed 21st century society. So that's a lot of material to get through. Um, thanks again for being here. Uh, and just as a reminder, because we do have so much to talk about, if both panelists and audience members alike could be uh, complete yet succinct in both their questions and answers, uh, even probably more succinct than I've just been. Uh, so in order to begin, I'm going to, uh, to offer the resolution. 20th century capitalism is failing 21st century society. From the audience, could I please see a show of hands, those who agree with the resolution? All right, I'm going to say that's about 40 to 50 percent. How many disagree with the resolution? That's probably 20%. We have a roll call vote. What? Can we have a roll call vote? No. Well, we could, yeah. Unfortunately, this is a room without the little voting machines. Uh, and because it is an option, how many are undecided? Ooh, at least it's a resolute group. So okay. Actually, I'm, I'm curious from the panel, uh, if I could just throw this out, how many of you are in favor of the proposition that 20th century capitalism is failing 21st century society? We have one vote. One against four. OK. So we know where Sharon will stand. She will be the, uh, the confrontationalist. I think I'm outnumbered. There's something slightly unfair about this. Come forward. I um, <laughs> assume it's not a gender-related issue, either. Uh, could be. OK. So uh, as promised, I was, uh, I'm going to, because I don't think it necessarily makes sense to have them answer in turn the same question five different times, I'm going to throw out a smaller premise that I hope will get us some information moving towards the larger premise. So here's, here's a concept that's been much discussed in the press, including time and, and other places in the aftermath of the economic crisis. And these premises are necessarily vague and generalized. So we can drill down deeper into them as we discuss. But here, here's a premise. Corporations have too much power. And here I'm not just talking about 
you know, arguably under-regulated -regul companies in Western liberal democracies, but also, you know, resurging state capitalism systems in China and, and Russia, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Now, Sharon, I, um, as probably the designated uh, confrontationalist, I have a feeling that you would agree to this premise. Absolutely. You, what you've got, we believe in a principle called fair go all round. And when you have extremes of power on any side of the equation, then whether it's uh, capitalism or governance or uh, gov uh, governments, then the balance gets out of whack. And right now we've lost a moral compass. We think you need to reset, redesign to some extent capitalism. We believe, by the way, in, in sustainable business and secure jobs, so it's not about the system, it's about the model of the system. And uh, when you have the greatest inequity since just before the 30s depression, this is actually bad news for capitalism because their prescriptions are actually eating themselves up potentially. If you look at Europe, you've now got the latest predictions of uh, negative growth. And yet we warned that rushing mindlessly to austerity, listening to the obscenity of the marriage between the ratings agencies, three, an oligopoly in the world, too much power if there was ever any uh, example of that, and the bond markets, without sitting down and looking to a growth strategy, would fail both business and workers. So think of some of the statistics. Greatest inequity be, since before 1930, you've actually, and the Great Depression, you've actually got 17 of the richest countries in the world who've gone backwards in equitable terms. What's that do to demand? Then you've got uh, 210 million people out of work. So the market's lost its capacity to actually soak up uh, people who need to be employed to have a job, to create that demand, to, do, to generate sustainability. And we have 45 million young people, our children and grandchildren, entering the labour market every year to economies that can't, can't accommodate them. So, you know, I could go on. I mean, there's a, the, the greed. We must redesign uh, the model, but we must reset it. Greed, stop the greed. You know, there's of the high worth individuals, there's something like $11 trillion plus in offshore assets. That's $250 billion of tax that could be going towards, in fact, it's something like three times the amount of aid provided to the developing world. And if you look at taxation, you know, this is now a national sport everywhere. Avoid taxation. We actually need to say if capitalism's going to sustain itself, it is going to provide secure jobs. It has to distribute wealth evenly and it has to make a contribution to the common good. And let me fi say finally on the power piece, greed, uh, profit above all, you know, unless you actually reinvest in social protection, the social protection floor now endorsed by many of uh, the uh, world's leaders and ourselves, unless you actually invest in minimum wages on which you can live and unless you reinvest in collective bargaining to distribute the wealth, then frankly, the, those who want to have greed at all costs, to not work with uh, unions and other civil society groups in terms of the common good, whether it's bargaining with unions or aid and development with others, then you're actually undermining your own future. So absolutely, too much power and it's time to reset, redesign, let's see some innovation and let's get a seat at the table for the real economy. Will the real economy stand up? Mm. The financial sector is killing you. And, uh, and unless employers and workers actually sit at the table with governments and redesign the system, then it will continue to fail our societies. It's as simple as that. And nobody will like the social unrest that will follow. Thank you. Um, ben, I was going to ask you about this question because we talked about it a little bit in the green room. And you pointed out that this was a very vague concept, you know, power meaning what, corporation meaning what. But framed within her response, she talked a little bit about Iniquity. Sure. She talked a little bit about greed. There was an implied critique of, of governments and, and the, the uh, I would say, the late 90s style capitalism profit motive above all. Would you care to respond to the concept that, that you know, admittedly, vaguely, corporations have too much power? For the sake of the debate, my answer would be they have not enough power. Great. And the question is not enough power for what? I mean, I understand this is a debate about who's the villain, okay? Who's the culprit? And first of all, maybe the culprit is the philosophy. So the culprit is capitalism. Well, if you travel the world, you'll find places where the aspiration is to go to capitalism because it has lifted millions and hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. 
So maybe it's not the philosophy itself, it's the way we execute it. And then people say, oh, well, okay, if that's the case, maybe it's the corporations. Well, um, I heard the discussion. It was interesting to talk about securing jobs. Securing jobs is the problem. If you're in a job, you get the unions to secure where you are. But if I'm not in a job, how about creating jobs? Creating jobs is something completely different from a philosophical point of view than securing jobs. I think we have to have a real discussion. At the end of the day, we are living in a world that is shifting. Power is shifting from west to east. Reality is shifting from a physical world to a digital world. People are 24-7 involved. The young people have a very different set of criteria than the people that are in power today. So we need to talk about innovation, sustainability, I mean real sustainable. And we need to talk about reform, not just about corporations and greed. I mean, it's too easy. It's about decision making. Why does it take Europe <clears throat> two years to come to a conclusion that they knew that they had to face in any way? The only way that happened is bad news became worse because we waited two years to do the inevitable. Unless we are going to take the hard questions seriously, to be honest, this is a great let off of frustration, but it doesn't solve anything. Can I just ask one follow-up question? I mean, th that was a fantastic answer, and it provides a lot of fodder for the rest of our discussion. But you introduced it saying that the corporations don't have enough power. What, what would you like your corporation or other corporations to do that you feel that they're unable to do? So I, I took three points. The first point that I, I took was, let's see what we can do in innovation. Innovation means creating. If you look to legislation and regulation, you know, I'm a, I'm a green believer. So um, if we want to do what we really need to do, we bump into conflicting priorities from all kinds of regulators, the EU, the American government, and all kinds of others. In one side, they say this is what we want, but the rest of the world, their own world, isn't there yet. So there are all kinds of conflicts there. That's why I say not enough power. We need to choose... Got it. Okay. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of great information here, and we will get back to a lot of it. I'm going to move on to uh, another premise, uh, and I like the way that Ben framed it because let's be frank. You know, he said really a lot of what this panel is about is who is the villain, who is to blame, and um, frankly, uh, banks have received a lot of the blame uh, for a lot of the problems that uh, the economic system has suffered over the past several years. Uh, so I have a premise here that large banks can cause harm to the social good because they enjoy a disproportionately favorable risk-to-reward ratio, or I guess it would be reward-to-risk ratio. Uh, this is the too-big-to-fail syndrome. Uh, then there seems to be an ongoing social bitterness and resentment that being too big to fail is both a real and vicious cycle. Now, Professor Rajan, I'm going to ask you whether or not you agree with this premise, because if I'm not mistaken, you have written about this quite extensively, including in most recently in the most recent issue of Time. So would you take a four position on this, that to a certain degree banks do have an overly favorable reward-to-risk ratio? Uh, I think the answer is yes for large banks, but let me come to that in one second because okay. I want to address the previous uh, debate a little bit. I mean, this issue of uh, inequality and whether, you know, warped corporate governance is the, is the cause of this inequality, I think that was the premise that we first heard. And I would argue that there are deeper forces which are driving the inequality. And, and unless we tackle those deeper forces, we have no chance of rectifying it. Um, so I think three big forces, the fact that technology has, has uh, required greater and greater skills. Second, the fact that we have a global market now, and therefore the competition for talent is global, and talent is more important because it has a global um, uh, arena in which it plays. And, and third, uh, that, that, that clearly over time the, the rewards to innovation, the need for innovation is also increasing. Again, the demand for skills. So technology, competition, globalization, need for innovation, all these are pushing for higher pay at higher levels of skills. Now, this is not to say that this explains what is happening at the top 0.1%, but clearly when you look at the top 90th percentile, why that's running away from the 50th percentile, it's ultimately because of these forces. These are not going to be affected by corporate governance. Lawyer, uh, doctors and lawyers today 
are earning much more than they used to. A lot of the people in the top 1% are not necessarily just corporate executives. They're lawyers, they're doctors, they're professionals. The returns to skills have increased. But the and minimum wage in America is $7.20. Because That's lower in real terms than in 1969. How can those people buy your product? That is a different question. The question is whether the skills are being rewarded justly or whether this is co a complete failure of corporate governance. I don't think it's a failure of corporate governance by and large. Not to say there aren't egregious instances where corporations overpay their executives. Those are problematic. But I don't think by and large you can explain the rise in wages of the uh, upper levels of the population simply by uh, you know, bad corporate governance. Now to the question that you asked me a okay, minute on you. that. Uh, clearly, large banks have had an advantage. Uh, they are too big to fail. They are too complicated to fail. That is not to say immediately that the answer is to break them down. Uh, you may replace too big to fail by too many to fail. And we have seen instances, certainly during the Great Depression in the United States, the big question was, why do we have so many small banks? Because they're fa failing like flies. Uh, we need to find ways to uh, revive them. We got deposit insurance then. So uh, the immediate answer is not uh, shut down the large banks and create a lot of smaller banks. It, it is to a, make the larger banks better managed and uh, second, uh, have the larger banks carry better buffers, a and third, make the larger banks more failable, so to speak, more easy to fail so they don't enjoy this premium, uh, which I think is a travesty of capitalism. When any entity sort of survives, uh, regardless of how bad it does, when it, there's no chance of it being destroyed, it prevents entry, it prevents competition, and that ultimately is the cause of the demise of capitalism. Mm. Okay. Um, now, Brian, I think that you might... <laughs> be interested in taking the opposite side of whether or not uh, banks enjoy a disproportionate reward to risk ratio? I think you have to go back and it's embedded in all this is what, what the role we play as an institution. So we play a role where we transmit in society basically what goes on. We're, we reflect economies of whatever country a bank is in by and large. And so when capital markets are going strong, you'll see capital markets activity heat up. When consumers are borrowing, you'll see that heat up. And so we do that for everybody here. I mean, we literally, clients of, uh, uh, like Alcatel or clients like the university he works for, and clients like unions. Um, you know, in our relationships with the unions around the world, we do things like uh, uh, credit cards where they receive uh, revenue from that stream to help uh, uh, promote and provide what they can do. So we reflect the economy. So our, the, quote, power that we have or the size that we have comes from the size of the economies. And, and so that's a reality. Now, against that is we also reflect the excesses. Mm -hmm. And so what you saw is that the econ economic excesses build up. The financial service system in the United States and around the world reflected that. And so the amount of leverage the amount that the consumer is taking on, transmitting that, we've done a lot to pull that out. And the regulations and rules that the societies have developed around the uh, world have changed that, whether it's the Basel III on the one hand, whether it's Bod Frank. And I think that there's been a lot done on that. And that's the kind of corrective course of capitalism. We have a boom and bust. But I, I think the idea that we enjoy some sort of special thing, we also pay you know, a lot of, of special things. So the FDIC insurance in the United States is paid for by the system. And the cost of that is largely in smaller bank failures today. But that's the reality of what goes on, and, and, and we're fine with that. So I think if you think about it, our power size capabilities come from our clients, mm -hmm. the 285,000 people we employ, what we do to transmit that in society. Every piece of revenue is a representative of economic activity taking place. The amount of things that went on that would have considered to be excessive and off to the side have largely been constrained. And most of the people running the institutions that survived and took over the institutions that largely were outside the regulatory scheme and failed have brought that into a more sober-minded, more direct thing. And the third thing is, is we are also going to reflect the, the pluses and minuses of capitalism. So when mm -hmm. there are excesses, you'll have boom and bust cycles, real estate related in the late 80s in the United States, foreign uh, uh, debt related, uh, Latin American debt related, and emerging debt related in another, <coughs> cent, uh, another decade. But the job is to continue to learn from that, correct it, and try to keep it. Mm -hmm. And there's times when innovation stuff gets ahead of it and makes it harder to do, and that's what we're going through now. Sharon, you're, you're shaking your head. Oh, look, I just find this incredible. You know, too big to fail is about socialising your losses, not about sustainability in a genuine sense, not about serving the real economy. And, in fact, what it is is about being so big that when it works against good governance, works against comp competition in terms of 
the price of credit to small to medium enterprise, for goodness sake. I actually agree with Ben. This is a bit scary, really. But uh, <laughs> much of what he said about sustainability, innovation, small to medium enterprise and the relationships are right. However, if you've got a, a group, 29, I think the Financial Stability Board says, that are too big to fail, what does it mean? It means that you are the biggest bullies on the planet because when your governance fails, then in fact you actually demand of governments, because they don't have any choice, to bail you out with whose money? With our money, with taxpayers' money. And who's bearing the sovereign debt costs now? The crisis didn't create... Uh, sovereign debt didn't create the crisis. Crisis created sovereign debt. And you know what? We stupidly bought into it. We actually promoted the stimulus packages that the uh, then director of the IMF called for and government heads said would actually help leverage demand. And in some countries it worked because it went to jobs, went to the real economy, the retail sector, the construction. In many countries it went to bail out the banks. And that's still the debate three years on. In fact, the second wave of the crisis, the fact that we've got now a bitter crisis of unemployment, greater impoverishment is because governments were too coward to move to do what they said they'd do. You remember them saying at the height of 2008-9, never again will the, uh, the uh, financial sector be in control of the real economy. Well, guess what? Inaction, government inaction, is the reason we're now in this situation again. Well, that, that segues nicely to my next point. I think that things are going lively enough that we don't necessarily need to hold to the debate premise format. But uh, I do have a question for you, David, then, um, because you were going to be uh, uh, one of the people that I picked out. You, Sharon just mentioned, you know, government regulation. And I think, uh, you know, in your role as the Car at the Carlisle Group, you might have a thought about whether or not increased government regulation is possible, desirable, and a solution to the current economic crisis. But before I address that, uh, I'd like to everybody just think back. I suppose this panel was being held 100 years ago, and the question was in 1912, um, did, is 19th century capitalism ready for the 20th century or going to help the 20th century? And look what happened in the 20th century. Uh, we, we really couldn't have predicted in 1912 what, what happened throughout the, the, the entire 20th century, and there were, nor can we predict now where 21st century capitalism is going to take us because we're only 12 percent into the century. But what happened in the, in, the, in the 20th century was that you had fights between communism and socialism and capitalism as the prevailing economic model for the world, and more or less capitalism prevailed. Not because capitalism was perfect. Nobody said capitalism was perfect. As Winston Churchill famously said about democracy, it's the worst form of government except every other form. Capitalism may be the worst form of economic um, uh, systems except every other system. Capitalism prevailed at the end of the 20th century and now into the 21st century because it more or less provided more wealth, more, more productivity, more jobs for people than anything else uh, the man could come up with. However, it has its imperfections. And it, those imperfections are seen best when you, when you have a, the current environment we have. We've been in a very deep recession, the Great Recession. When you look at something at the trough of any, any kind of economic uh, period of time, it's going to look very bad. So as a result of this recession, which has lasted much longer than anybody predicted and will probably go on for a number more years, in effect, we really never got out of the Great Recession, in my view, uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of economic disparity. The two greatest problems that capitalism has produced, and capitalism still will produce for many years into the 21st century, is it doesn't have the ability to uh, modulate uh, risk and reward and, and growth and, and, uh, and lack of growth. And so you have these boom and bust periods of time. For a while in the latter part of the 20th century, we thought we were so smart that we eliminated the economic cycle. We haven't really done that. So we still have to deal with the economic problems of boom and bust, and we're seeing the problems of the bust right now still affecting many of the people that you're worried about. Many of these people are really hurting, and this is one of the problems that capitalism uh, produces. Secondly, we have the problem that um, uh, disparity, economic disparity is very, very bad in many parts of the world, and capitalism has not solved that problem. Capitalism has many great virtues, and many people are wealthier than they ever were before, but we haven't solved the economic disparity problem. The question is, how do we deal with it? How do we eliminate the economic boom and bust cycle in capitalism, and how do we um, eliminate the economic disparity? Obviously, nobody in this panel has this answer, and nobody in the world seems to have this answer. The question is, how can we work through this problem? And my view is that government is supposed to be the leader. Uh, we, we, we elect people to be our leaders because, and, and government because they are the ones who are supposedly the ones who have the ideas and want to lead us. 
And I think what we'd like much more in the business community is leadership from the government officials that we elect. <clears throat> in the West, we have seen a lot of um, uh, inability to provide leadership during this recession, and I think that is one of the problems that has uh, created the continued um, uh, economic disparity and the continued uh, growth of the uh, or the lack of our ability to get out of this uh, recession. I wish we had more economic leadership. In terms of regulation, um, everybody thinks they're overregulated. I've never met anybody who says, please regulate me more. I need more regulation. I, I need your help. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says, tax me more. I want more taxes, with possible exception of Warren Buffett. Nobody ever says, tax me more. And nobody ever says, regulate me more. So I don't think that I want to be more regulated. Uh, my concern is that whenever there is an economic problem, uh, in the United States, we had Enron, we had a recession. What we do afterwards, at least in the United States, is we regulate and we pass legislation. We pass Dodd-Frank's, which is 2,300 pages, the regulations for which have not been issued. The Volcker Rule, with the most famous part, perhaps, of the Dodd-Frank's, hasn't, hasn't had any regulations that are finalized like yet. The business community doesn't really know what the rules are that we're supposed to live by. So, yes, we're, we don't mind regulations in the business world. We think regulations are appropriate, but tell us what they are in a reasonable period of time in a simple way so we can actually operate in under what the government wants us to do. Right now, many people in the business world think that we don't know what the government really wants us to do. If we do A, we're going to be criticized. If we do B, we're going to be criticized. Just tell us what you want in a simple uh, way, and we'll try to comply the best we can. So I don't think we have too much regulation in some respects, and I, I think we just don't have a clear regulation, and it's not timely in, 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 in many ways. In my own business, the private equity business, uh, we, we, we would say we have uh, you know, a fair amount of regulation. Maybe people want more regulation. Um, I think in the banking world, there's no doubt a lot of regulation. But uh, I, I think the principal problem we have now is the lack of clarity on what the regulation really is, and getting this regulation done in a, in a timely manner frustrates the business community more than anything else I know. It's not the fact that regulation is going to occur. Great. Private equity could do two things without any more regulation. They could pay the taxes they should pay. Look at the Romney scandal overnight, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. So just pay the taxes, well, wait, stop, wait, stop so cheating on what is already a requirement. And secondly... They are what, paying the taxes. And what, the, 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 the law... I didn't write the law. I don't know who made the law, but whoever made the law, they're paying, everybody's paying their taxes. They, you, if you change the law, they'll pay the taxes. Romney simply said, I'm not his defender. He's paying whatever the law required. If you want to change the law, change the law. But don't criticize him for, for paying the taxes that the law requires him to pay. But we can show you the figures where the corporations are not paying the tax. In the UK, you know, $14, trillion, the $14 law. billion. Dollars. It's, it is the law. It is the law. But there, you're right, there are loopholes. But why can't we have governance that's just fair dinkum. Normal people pay their taxes. If they've got a bill to pay, they pay it. And the second thing they could do is actually stop with the shadow trading economy. So you know, the, the over-the-counter products all wonderful, wonderful us Twitter to our lines. Needs. These are all wonderful Twitter lines, and it underlines one basic issue that I find here. We, we suffer from nostalgia because we want to go back to the world that we knew. No, that's well, not true. Guys, listen. We're not going back to the world that we knew because we are not in, a, in, a, in a, an incident. We are in transformation. That means the world that we knew, we leave behind and we go to the new world. So all these wonderful things of pointing fingers and saying taxes and all the rest of it, it's not the issue. It is not as easy as David says, just tell us what we do, what you want us to do, we do. Because the problem is our governments don't know. We don't know, they don't know. So it's not as easy to say what we want to do. We have to go in transformation. And the transformation is driven, in my view, only by three things. First of all, we are more connected as a world than we ever have been. So what happens in one part of the world has an immediate impact on the other. That was never the case. The second thing is we are in a 24-7 information drill. Whatever happens here has an impact immediately around the world. We have no safety barriers there. There is no time to react, and there is no time to think. And the third element, maybe the most important thing, it's all about creation of jobs. And technology is creating new jobs that are very different than the old jobs, and maybe in very different places in the world. So instead of getting the battle of nostalgia, could we please move on and talk about a transformation because, in the meantime, governments are still organized as they were in 1912. Institutions are still organized as they were in 1950. And companies maybe were as they were in 
2011, something like that. So we have to move on on all those three layers. Mm -hmm. Transformation's right, but for what? What are the value set? What's the value set of a society where capitalism should serve uh, the uh, the cohesion, the growth? greater equity, these are the questions we should be asking. If you start to admit that this transformation, you don't talk in the first line about job security, you talk about job creation. You talk about the next generation, you talk about young people who have no chance today that need to get chances in the future. I'm absolutely Mm. up for job creation. In fact, we can show you 2% invested in the green economy, which you profess to, uh, to actually enjoy over 12 countries, by five years equals 55 million jobs. Why can't we have it right now? The money's there. It's on the balance sheets of uh, companies that are not investing in non-financials in the US, $2 trillion. There's a capital strike here. So we can talk about that, Ben, but let's talk about what the function of, uh, of the market is. What's the function of business? I'm not talking about anything other than jobs for people who don't have them, secure incomes so that they can buy your product and we have sustainable demand. We want a seat at the table. I've been through... You can't wipe labour off to the side. We've been through in Australia, one of the most stable economies, all of these structural adjustments. We are at the table. We've created the skills revolution in Australia. Who did that? The, the unions, government with business. When people work together, when we accept responsibility, and you don't just have the 1%, the, the, the wealthy folk that can actually say, well, you know, we'll decide what's good for us. When you have people sitting at the table taking responsibility. So my challenge to business is come to the table, real economy. I'm not interested in the greed of the financial sector. I am interested in the financial sector that serves the real economy, productive wealth. But we've got to actually stand up and say, how do we generate those jobs? How can we provide secure incomes? How can we sustain demand? And by the way, how can we move in to a low carbon future? Um, well, business must have come together in Australia, I assume, to do what you wanted, right? They must have come together and you, you're happy with what happened. Is that right? Well, I can tell you the vulnerabilities of the two-speed economy in Australia, but what I'm pointing to is people. when people work together, you have a solution. When people work in the interests of their own greed, their own direction, when there is too much power in any one part of the spectrum, mm-hmm. government, workers or indeed uh, representative right. labour or business... The, the, the world gets out of whack. And right now it's out of whack because business, particularly the financial sector, has lost its moral compass. Well, in Australia, the business community, I guess, came together with the labour community, and you're reasonably happy with it. So the business community couldn't have lost its moral compass in Australia. Presumably, wow. um, the model of Australia may be a very good one. Maybe other people Excellent. should take a look at it. So the business community is not losing, I don't think it's lost its moral compass. I think the business community wants to create jobs. The business community wants to create jobs and create wealth. The more jobs they create, the greater wealth they're going to create. Their shareholders are happier. The executives are happier. So they're not exactly sitting there saying, how can we reduce jobs and reduce wealth? We want to make sure that the system doesn't work. Business people want to make the system work. Now, it's not easy to do. Maybe the Australian model is, is one we should look at. But it's not that business people are sitting in their, in their, in their boardroom saying, how can we find our moral compass. We don't really have a moral compass. We're against creating jobs. We're against making sure workers have enough to live on. They don't want to do that. They, they are, want everybody they to be happy. They are pro-short-termism. If I, well, if I short-termism won't well, short-termism work. is not something that business community invented, for sure. There's no doubt there can be improvement, but the Australian model is perhaps something that business community should look at. Okay, if I, this is great stuff, and clearly we're having a debate. So this is, this is, this is fantastic. If I could just back, absolutely, no, this is, this is great because, um, you know, these are clearly hot button issues and these are some of the things that this entire, um, you know, meeting is going to be talking about for the next four to five days. If I could just back up a little bit and summarize for some of the things from my standpoint that I think that we've been talking about. Um, some of the key words that keep coming up again and again are in- inequality uh, and, and prosperity and disparity. Uh, innovation, globalization, a shift of power from east, I'm sorry, from west to east. Uh, I'm, I regret the fact that we don't have a representative from a major governmental power to talk about the role of government here, but I also think that the, you know, either the role of government or the lack of uh, clarity from government are interesting concepts, but I think it does keep coming back to, this entire discussion keeps coming back to jobs, job creation versus uh, job stability in what sounds like developing versus already developed countries, and uh, anxiety, especially in the Western world, about um, income inequalities when, in fact, jobs are moving to uh, developing economies rather nicely, it would seem like. 
Um, you know, Professor Rajan, do you, do you want to chime in on anything having to do with, with some of the summarizations or what you've, you've heard here so far? Sure. Um, thanks for giving the chance to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I think what we, we have to step backwards. I think nostalgia is a bad thing, but it, it, you know, the past does affect where we are. Uh, where are we, why are we in this situation? In some sense, because growth has failed us relative to the promises we made. Governments made a ton of promises in the 60s when growth was very high. They, you know, we had the welfare state uh, across the industrial world. And then growth started falling off in the 70s, in the 80s. Uh, some countries, the UK, the US, tried to revive it through deregulation and managed for a while. But in general, the real issue is our growth is too slow in, industri in the industrial world relative to the, to the promises we have made. Therefore, just saying that the government should go out and spend and create new jobs is not the answer. We have to revitalize growth. That is the long-term answer. How do we do that? Two essential ingredient, ingredients. One, we need more innovation, more productivity growth in the industrial world. That means giving entrepreneurs the right to go out and innovate, to create new companies and so on. We have to make sure we don't destroy that environment. That's very important. Otherwise, we'd be stuck in a negative spiral in these countries. The second thing is we have to improve the capabilities of the workforce. And I think that's very important for the kinds of jobs that will be created when we have this innovation. There, I think a partnership between government, industry, and labor is extremely important. This is something that we have neglected for a, uh, for a fair amount of time, especially in the United States, where the capabilities are falling behind uh, tremendously. But my sense is, if you put these two together, you have a chance of leveling up, reducing inequality by leveling up, which I think is the way we want to go, rather than reducing inequality by leveling down, which I think would be detrimental to longer-term growth. The final thing I would, I would like to say here is that even though you have inequality rising in industrial countries, as you pointed out, one of the reasons for this is because some of the emerging markets are, in fact, rising in wealth. And therefore, globally, some of this is having an effect in reducing inequality rather than increasing. But that is not to say one shouldn't feel for the worker in industrial countries who is now seeing uh, wages not rise. But I think the answer to that is improved capabilities. Longer term answer, it's not a short term answer, but it's the most sustainable answer. Yeah, yeah Brian, do you have um, either something to add or elaborate on that, or what, where Bank of America can fit in in that? Well, I, I, look, just going more broad, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of corporate companies and corporations, so we get a pretty good insight of how they're thinking. But I think one of the fundamental things is, first of all, I disagree with the premise that we've, we've lost our moral compass, but that's. Uh, a different thing. But I think the fundamental thing we're dealing with is, is most of the ways, and I think it's embedded in some of the dialogue earlier, that we define systems as country by country. The reality is uh, even relatively mid-sized companies are now global citizens. And so the shift in demand is actually the difference in the cycle we're in now versus other cycles. So uh, take a classic American company who would quote offshore workers and all the things that people would talk about. The difference now is the actual demand they're filling is outside the country. Mm -hmm. So the the way we define the success of capitalism or not is usually country by country by how they have applied it, whereas the reality is that participants are not, no longer single country citizens at all. And that's a relatively modest sized companies are involved in the global chain, not only from where they get the products, which is traditional, mm -hmm. but where they sell the products. That then changes the scheme. So, the, so when you talk about a moral compass of creating jobs, is it, is it great to create jobs? You're creating jobs all over the world. And, as, and so the difference between creating jobs in country A who the people in country A may feel good or bad about versus country B, same thing. The issue is, is from a company's perspective, they're trying to grow, they're trying to fill the demand where the demand exists, they're trying to drive that growth, they're trying to innovate into that growth, and that then leads to this problem that in some of the societies that where, where they're suffering, the types of things the professor talked about, the reality is they're filling the same demand that they used to fill, it's just over here, and that's going to be tough for us to deal with in the more developed societies. But That's this, the this is interesting That's because... That's not it, the debate, though. It's, the debate is how do you create jobs everywhere? Right. You know, it's not about pitting worker against worker or company base against company base. Now, I'm a global labour leader. Right. It's about creating jobs everywhere. But I, but I think we this is the globalisation issue. We absolutely issue. agree with It's about creating jobs everywhere, but the reality is when demand moves, the, 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 the simple uh, discussion about taking something, raw materials, shipping someplace else, manufacturing, shipping back when you can take the raw materials 
uh, convert in there to the final product and sell that final product changes this dynamic. Well, we dynamic. have no argument with you about that, Brian. In fact, this is the dialogue we want to have. Right. How do you create jobs every year? What are the strengths of modern economies? Right. What's the financial base that actually serves productive wealth, the real economy? And that's what's not happening. So, 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 so companies posture, feel defensive. Yeah. I get that because I don't you know, feel defensive at all. No, no, but. <laughs> You know, so, people get upset, you know, the 99% versus the 1% social unrest is growing. But take any part of the world. I mean, you know, the North African revolutions, despite the kind of uh, absolute, uh, you know, need for democracy, those young people are now absolutely having their hopes dashed because the jobs aren't there. The scale and urgency of creating jobs requires all of us and all of us to take responsibility, not to simply say, well, we've moved our production here. That's not the argument. The argument is, what's the productive future in every country that will give our kids and our grandkids jobs on which they, no. with wages on which they can okay, live? OK, Brian them. first, then David. One, one, one second. So I agree with the jo creating jobs as a principle. And now I want you to come back to why we have to have size and scale as an institution is to be able to support people who are operating in talent to support people to operate all across all those economies. And that, that then leads to a larger size because our scale is not defined by the United States economy, which is one of the largest. It's defined by the worldwide economy, which is multiples of the United States. And so this too big issue that we're talking about, we are a result of that. And so that, that's the linkage I think people start to lose. We're not big because we're big. We're big because our clients are operating around the world. We have to be able to support them. I think that's David, the when the Cold War ended more or less uh, and the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the view was in the world that Western-style capitalism had prevailed and that more or less the United States and Western European style capitalism was to be the model for the future. And unfortunately, the people who were in those economic systems probably got a little um, complacent and they didn't do as many things as they should have done to create new jobs. And as a result, the people in the emerging markets said, well, we follow the ideas of the Western uh, capitalist system, but we can do them even better. And so they worked harder, they innovated more, they did many of the things that we said that they should do, and they basically ate our lunch for about 10 years or so. And as a result, you now have two types of capitalism competing with each other. The Western-style capitalism, which is largely laissez-faire, fair, though to some extent in Europe there's more government involvement, and, the, and more state capitalism uh, that you now see in China and other governments where the government is much more heavily involved in trying to create jobs. It's unclear which model will prevail. Right now, there seems to be a, uh, a view that the state capitalism model creates more jobs. They may not be high-paying jobs. They may, they may not be the jobs that many people in the West would like to have, but they seem to be able to create jobs at a greater rate than we are in the West. What we have to do in the West is recognize that we have some severe problems. We have to solve our debt problems. We have to solve our deficit problems. We have to solve some of our entitlement problems. We have to make our government much more efficient. If we don't do that in the West, in the United States and Western Europe, the state capitalism model will prevail. And while that is probably good in some respects for people living there compared to what they had before, it is not going to create the kind of high-paying jobs with the kind of retirement security that people in the West have come to want. All right. Ben's been waiting so patiently. I'm sorry. And then we'll come to... I think the essence of any form of capitalism is the consumer, who is a free choice. Now, the consumer is also the citizen. There is, however, unfortunately, no law that they have to be consistent. So the consumer goes to the grocery shop and buys globalization. Then with his two bags full of globalization, turns around to the government when he leaves the shop and said, protect me against the results of this. And that's their right to do that. Mm -hmm. Because as a, as a citizen, you have different emotions than as a consumer. But at the heart of everything we do is a buying consumer with a choice. Now, I think the uncomfortable truth is that, yes, we have pockets of disillusion and, and unfulfilled promises that we have to deal with because there are so many new consumers on the market now that have their rights and they, their day in court. I mean, we talk about doom and gloom here in Davos. If you would go to Brazil today and you would talk about where the world is, they have a very different view. And if you look to young people in the, uh, in the, in the megapoles of, of, of India, they have a very different view of where the world is. So this is a very different discussion depending where you are and how you look at it. And on globalization, I think the real uncomfortable truth is 
is that we think that we take decisions on a national level. Well, the reality is that most of the decisions are taken either regionally or globally, mm -hmm. and that the other component is not national but local. Mm -hmm. So there is a handshake between global and local, but unfortunately we still have the assumption that everything has to be translated on the national level. And they're in the middle and squeezed. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's this uncomfortable decision-making. Because if you want to get really talking about jobs, it's not on a national level. You have to do it locally. You have to have one university and one set of innovation and one cluster that works together. That is the local power <coughs> that brings globalization mm -hmm. to reality. Mm -hmm. Raghu, did you? Yeah, um, two things. One on uh, the uh, state capitalism. I do think uh, it is another form of capitalism, but I think it has natural limits. It is very good for catch-up. Uh, it is very good when the innovation is already out there, you can, you can take it up. But when you have to innovate yourself, large state-owned corporations are miserable at it. And, and that is where I think these state capitalist models will reach their limits, when they reach the frontiers. And then at that point, they will have to look for something different. Even in China today, the small and medium enterprises are contributing a lot to, uh, to growth. And, and, and I think that is where we should see hope in the emerging markets, that they in themselves will embrace the free enterprise capitalism that, uh, that the West has embraced. That said, I think the West has uh, one significant strength. It has already a large number of innovative corporations. It has to make it possible for the innovation to take place and allow that to feed through the economy. However, it has one challenge we haven't talked about yet. Uh, I think Ben referred to it a little bit, which is that demand is shifting. More and more of demand, uh, Ryan also talked about it, is coming from the emerging markets. In the past, it was very easy to run businesses here because demand was outside the window. You look at what's going on, all your innovation takes place here, all your finance, marketing, everything can be done here. When the markets move there, a lot of those activities will start moving there. That's when the challenge for creating even skill sector jobs in industrial countries will become harder. This is an, a, a, an interval of about 10 years when the industrial countries have the keep have the time to improve their capabilities. They have to use it well, not spend it in, in frittering away government spending, but use mm -hmm. government spending to improve the capabilities of the workforce. Mm -hmm. I think but the West, excuse me, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just sure. gonna pick up on this point, but you know, look, we think the only inclusive growth models at the moment can be found in places like Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay to some extent. I mean, if you go over the border to Chile, it's, it's profit uh, or uh, growth figures look fantastic, yet you have to take out a loan as a middle-income parent to send your kids to school or to get a health treatment. So the unrest there is enormous, and that's where the inequity plays into an inability to make growth work for societies. But I want to I come back to, uh, to two points. One is the fact that, you know, it's not as simple as saying the demand's moving there. If it was, it would backwash, and we'd all be a lot more comfortable. But... You know, China, India, Brazil, to some extent, emerging economies cannot pull the world out of a growth slump that now in Europe is going into negative figures. And indeed, because I don't have a growth strategy, I have an austerity strategy, but not a growth strategy. And, uh, and globally, is could be as low as half a percent. I mean, that's just, this is just going to get worse, not better. So I don't disagree with the optimism for emerging economies, and that's fantastic. But it's not going to help the globalisation, Ben, in terms of sustainability or stability that you want to help. And your point about consumerism is right. I mean, like it or not, capitalism is based on consumerism. Now, when the wages share has actually fallen, you know, relative to profits by a third over the last three decades, we're in trouble. You know, when the US president wants to raise the minimum wage in America, one of the biggest countries in the world, to $9.50 and corporations and indeed the Republicans are fighting him, it would do more for demand overnight in the US than almost anything else. If you had a minimum wage on which people can live in every nation and a social protection floor, you secure a basis of demand and then of course, you know, bargaining for distribution and so on based on collective uh, uh, and productive wealth over and above that, fantastic. But the American corporate model is doing two things. It's actually smashing wages because it's exporting its own aggressive opposition to collective bargaining. And if you don't have collective bargaining, I don't know what the, the answer is to fair distribution of wealth. 
because that's when people sit at the table, talk about what companies can be, and I might add, on the downsides, save companies. Without the unions in the US, in the, in the, in the uh, collapse of 2008-09, then car companies would have gone under. Without the short-term working model in Germany, then you would have seen unemployment in one of the most successful economies absolutely collapse. I could tell you the same about Australia, about the Netherlands. You know, there are models here that work, but unless people sit at the table on both the distributive side and the solution side when things get rough, you're not going to have sustainability or stability or generate without wages uh, growth that consumerism that will hold but, the but what uh, worries me in this speech, What worries me in this speech is that you are, at least you portray, to be the owner of the solution. No. I think what I'm missing to be part what, of it. No, no. What I'm missing <laughs> totally is the fact that in a world where, look to the to the youth. I mean, the youth is not running to the unions to, to join. So there is something there that we need to. You know, a lot of what you say makes sense, but a, a lot what you're missing is reform is not just on one side, the other side of the table. If you're sitting around the bargaining table, it is unfortunately necessary for all parties to think through how we reform. Absolutely. And, and what I hear you make a speech is, you know, we are ready in the, in, 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 in the solutions phase because you have the, the wisdom. And the other side, if they only would do what we want, then we go back to where we are. We don't go back to that situation. So what I would like to add is a little bit of perspective from your side. What is the reform that we can expect from the labor side? Because labor movements, I mean, I'm stunned to hear you say that, that, that work that goes from one country to the other is a bad thing, because it is new jobs in markets that may need them very much. I didn't say that, much. Ben. You said I said that. So what I, what I would like to... I didn't say that. And what I'm, I'd like to hear is, what is the new approach that, um, sure. that Labour is going to sure. take? OK. Well, first of all, I'm a global Labour leader. We have a global Labour market. For me, jobs should be everywhere, decent work, everywhere. There shouldn't be exploitation. There certainly shouldn't be some of the... While I, I'm not orthodox about state capitalism, and I would argue that something like Dubai Ports actually serves the private sector capitalism very well and operates probably more effectively in terms of bargaining with unions and others and some of the private sector, nevertheless, that's a model that no-one here would support. 21st century enslavement, where migrant workers often don't have their papers to move, let alone be able to have a cup of coffee with you or a meal in a restaurant taken home to labour camps. This is the basis on which capitalism is going to generate societies we can accept? No. And I don't believe that any of us has all the solutions. That's just infantile. What we do have is a responsibility. If we don't say, how do you generate jobs? If we're going to ride the wave of the green economy, which we have to, there are no jobs on a dead planet. How's that for reform, Ben? We want the green economy. We want investment and innovation that comes from it. You know, Germany has created the single biggest industry policy. Now, I know the Americans don't like talking about industry policy. We quite like it in Australia, much smaller market. But industry policy, for any other term you can put on it, in Germany has been created by a political decision forced by people. No more nuclear energy. Be for it or against it, doesn't matter. It will generate billions of dollars into innovation, New export products, it'll keep Germany's, uh, you know, export uh, uh, kingmanship alive for decades to come. But you've got to invest. And it's not, I'm not saying, again, it's all government investment. On the contrary, with the balance sheet sitting in, in corporations, we can do a lot. The green, the, the climate tax, fought by corporations everywhere in Australia, particularly the resource sector. But in fact, that will gener do more to generate the 2 to 3 per cent. And that's our demand for Davos. 2 to 3 per cent of investment in jobs, in the productive economy, in the real economy, with employers and unions and government actually sitting at the table. And it doesn't have to be government expenditure. On the contrary, it can facilitate unleasing the talents of, uh, and the wealth of corporations. But what about also the informal economy? If we're talking about entrepreneurism, all we're doing with this model is, is actually shoving economies, including the developed world, into the informal sector. People are desperate to survive. So you've got an informal economy, some of it shadow economy in the developed world, but you've got between 30 and 90 per cent, depending on the developed or the developing world. How can capitalism sustain itself if it's not formalised? 
We, we, I agree we should have this forum next year in Australia, because obviously well, there are a lot of good answers there. I actually live in Belgium these days, but... Uh, oh, okay. We'll do it there, too. I was the Australian lady. I have lady. a million and one questions that I could continue to ask. Raghu has been waiting uh, patiently for her response, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor to questions. So if you want to start thinking about what you want to ask now. Uh, Raghu, did you have a... Well, uh, just that uh, ultimately, if you boil down capitalism to its roots, uh, it's about paying people the marginal product of their wages. And you can rail about that all you want, but if the marginal product of people's uh, work is less than the wages you propose to pay them, firms make losses and ultimately can't employ those workers. So the, the critical question we have here is how do we increase the marginal product? Uh, that's the way to get wages up. And how do you do that in the industrial world? That's the debate we should be having. By all means, we can transfer, we can raise the minimum wage, et cetera. But if that exceeds the marginal product, you're essentially driving firms into penury. So uh, I, I think the, the right debate is how do we get the innovation, how do we get the productivity, how do we get the job creation as a result of that? Not and how do you distribute the profits? Eventually, those profits will get distributed. But sure, there's a, there's a margin that you can distribute. But you can't distribute more than the marginal product of somebody's labor. Ultimately, they have to be productive citizens. It's called bargaining. No, by all means, bargaining takes place. But all I'm saying is you cannot legislate a minimum wage which is more than what a person is no, producing. And, and let's, let's put, the, again, the facts on the table. We are all involved as labour leaders in either advocating or bargaining for both minimum wages and collective agreements. And you cannot bargain more than you can afford. So I'm on your table about that. But come on, the wealthiest country in the world where people have to borrow to actually pay for groceries, can't afford more than $7.20 an hour. It's not helping capitalism because they don't have the money to buy the product, but it's actually leaving people impoverished. But, now, but again, you're switching to affordability rather than productivity. Well, right? no, I mean, I mean for this... both. Let's get the productivity, but I can show you the productivity figures and what makes it grow and what makes it, it collapse. And we can show you what's happened to you. demand. You're all suffering from a lack of demand. Yet no one wants to talk about wages. Why? Because it might just take a sliver off the profits that have been exorbitant in the major companies. Now, for small to medium companies, it's absolutely a balancing act. And you have to bargain your way through all of those factors, productivity, innovation, skills, and indeed the, the, the uh, productive uh, uh, wealth distribution of wages after that. So anyone who wants to put us in a camp and say, well, they're over here, they're against capitalism, they want to break the bank, that's not true. What we want, though, is a sense of the fair go all round. And right now, it is there are corporations that are way too big with way too much power, and it is about that global reach. I'm actually certainly not against globalisation. That's my job. And, uh, and we believe in everybody having a, a, a chance at development. But if you have global corporations that cannot buy and sell governments effectively now, you're right. The model needs to be re-looked at. David, did you want to cap things off? Then we are going to move to the my, floor. My, my main point is, well, first, if the minimum wage were increasing, I'd say that'd be fine with, with me. I just don't think it'll solve all our economic problems. Our economic problems are very deep because of the debt and the deficit and, and other things. Um, I think we've got about three to four years in the West to improve the economic model we have. And if we don't do that soon, I, I think that we've lost the game in competing against emerging market capitalism or state capitalism because I think they just have a more efficient model right now, which is going to take a lot of jobs away from the West. So I think we've got to work through these problems. If we don't do it in three or four years, when we have this kind of session three or four years from now, the game will be over for the type of capitalism that many of us have, have lived through and thought was the best type of capitalism. Okay, we're, uh, we're going to reward the front row here. So we're going to go one, two, and then in the back there. So we'll do the first three this way. Good morning. My name is Jeff Jarvis. I found this to be incredibly frustrating. Uh, for what I've found is the institutions of the economy, corporation, equity, unions, banks, universities, taking zero responsibility for the state that we're in. And you're right, looking nostalgically at some past that is now completely gone. The people who are not here among the disrupted are the disruptors. The entrepreneurs, technologists, and young people who are creating that future and that next economy, the economy we should be talking about. So I'm going to ask them what the economy is. And I'd like to compare that with what you think the future economy is, because I haven't heard a single thing today, not only about responsibility for the past or vision for the future, somewhat from you, Mr. Hayden, but otherwise I've heard no vision, just a lot of nostalgic debate by the old institutions that frankly deserve to be disrupted. 
I think you know, Brian. We spend uh, this this well, it's very difficult in an hour and a half or hour and fifteen minutes with five people to give through uh, give somebody the complete view of how the view world is going to change in the future and how we can make the world better. Um, so I apologize that we didn't make it more interesting, but um, you know, next year you can be on the panel and I can sit there and I can tell you that I'd like to hear different answers. It's not that easy to uh, encapsulate all of the world's wisdom in an hour and 15 minutes, but you do make some very good points. Um, clearly, many of the people who are changing the world are not on this panel. Uh, many of the, the people are young people, and the, many of the people who lead the social networking revolution are not on this panel. Clearly, over the next five or ten years, the social networkers, the people who are communicating with each other through that mechanism, and the disruptors are going to be the people that change the world. What we've learned over the last hundred years or so is you're never able to predict who is going to make these changes and how the disruption is going to occur. People in our large kind of organizations we are are not generally the disruptors. The disruptors are people who are entrepreneurs, small organizations that we haven't heard of today. So to, five years from today, none of us probably would be invited back and different people will be up here because we will have been disrupted out of our positions. So, and we don't have five years to, be, to not be asked back. But there's, there's two things. First of all, all those people that you want to talk to are here in Davos. So, I mean, it's not that the web hasn't organized for it. You have the 20-year-olds, you have the 30-year-olds, you have the new entrepreneurs. Second, I mean, your last sentence was a great sentence listening to the applause. But you, I would think twice before you get what you wished for. Because disruption is great. But by, you said, destroy what we have. I'm not so sure that you will live with the consequences. But, you know, be my guest. <laughs> but he didn't say destruction. He said disruption. And I think that's right. I think that is a really valid debate. It wasn't the one we were posed with. But I actually think it's a really valid debate. How do institutions evolve, reset, redesign themselves for a 21st century? That will be very different. I mean, if we don't, if we don't see the political courage to tackle the climate challenge then, you know, this is all pretty irrelevant for our kids and grandkids, frankly. They're pretty frustrated with us. So if we don't see the, the capacity to do something genuinely about people to lift them out of poverty so we end civil wars, then the disruption to the old institutions will happen anyway. And it's the same for us. I don't think unionism is the same brand of product. You certainly wouldn't have seen a woman global leader, you know, 20 years ago, let alone 50 or 70 years ago, and you wouldn't have seen women's participation. You wouldn't have seen despite what Ben says, young people arguing for different models, but some of them back to the future too, cooperatives, you know, working together, networking, social networking across barriers that once they physically networked around in, in, uh, in a shared uh, wealth production environment. So I think your premise is a very good one. Sadly, it wasn't quite the debate we were posed with. Anyone else? Uh, sorry. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I mean, uh, I, I think there is a very real problem for the young today, and I, I think you can see it across countries. 40% uh, unemployment in Spain, uh, 45 in Greece, uh, largely concentrated amongst the youth. And, and I think the point you raise about the future being important, about uh, it, it visualizing it in a way that these people have a chance, I think that is the central question, the central threat to some extent to the capitalist system. If you don't draw people along, they are going to disrupt it. They are going to fight it, uh, not in the innovative way you're talking about, but in just overthrowing the institutions and, and perhaps trying to get a new, new set. Who knows what that might be? So I think it's extremely important we solve these problems. It may be that some of the solutions are the plain boring ones that we've been talking about rather than some innovations that we haven't uh, anticipated as yet. But who knows? It's probably a mix of both. Jobs. Brian, you want to make it five for five, or are you good where it stands? Uh, I Inside large organizations, the disruption goes on every day. So at the one hand, we have branches. The other hand, we have 9 million mobile banking customers. And the people who fund that help fund all that entrepreneurial society out there, but also do it inside. So one of the challenges running large organizations is how do you refresh and do that? And that really goes to, down to the question of talented people and treat them well and give them the spirit. So we have people who look like what you're posturing, and we have people who look like me, and everything in between. And our job is to hustle that both internally and externally, for the benefit of our customers. And so I think these premises that get thrown out, large companies aren't innovative. The premises that get thrown out that, you know, that uh, the, the big companies are – we've got to think that through, and that's the thing we need to think about, because the largeness is here and, and inevitable because economies are globalizing. The question is how do we make the jobs, how do we make the fairness, how do we make the things? Second point is 
you've heard me say it before here, you can hear me say, the people who run the institutions that you don't think take both very seriously the issues in the past, we absolutely do. And you should rest assured that how we run our institutions is so different than, the, than we ran them a few years ago, even if the people are sick. So that's not an acknowledgment. We're trying to move forward, though, and we know that, and we've learned from it. So don't ever, in my mind, ever discount the fact that we don't wear the scars still today, and we'll continue to wear them for the rest of our careers, and we understand that. Will we get it right next time? God only knows. We can't predict the future, but we all understand that. What we're trying to do is move forward to where the next, where the puck is going as opposed to where it's been. And that innovation, all the stuff you're talking about, it doesn't mean we don't remember what happened, believe me. The other frustration is that we've all spent many years of our life trying to get to the point where we get invited to be in this panel, and now somebody wants to disrupt us out of this, but okay. <laughs> right. So the, uh, the gentleman who has the microphone now, and then uh, the gentleman in the back after. Hey, hi, I'm Mohammed al I'm a part of the Global Shapers community, and I'm from Egypt. Um, I have a question. Uh, we no longer live in the industrial age, and everyone acknowledges this. Why are we insisting on managing it in the same old manner? I don't know if the new name is capitalism or something else, but what I care about, how can we have a practice that ensures a platform for young people to create these jobs? So instead of we creating the job for the young or all, the, all that sort of things, how can we create a platform that enables the young to create jobs for themselves and for others? Because it's about talent, and if we um, enable that talent to do that, uh, then maybe that's the solution. So what is the system, what is the practice that can, e can enable such platform? Can it's I a just, question to the panel. Can I just both support that and challenge it? Like, absolutely, we need the young entrepreneurs and they are going to create you know, new companies we haven't dreamed about yet and they should be supported. But don't dismiss what you call the old industrial age, you know, call it what you like. We have to produce twice as much food by 2050 as we do now, some people say three, three times, on less arable land. That is about innovation, but it's also about production, traditional production. So we have to get that right, and that requires a sharing around the globe. If you were, you know, a, a slightly younger uh, Labor leader like me in the early 90s, and we heard that, you know, the, the technology was going to change the face. There were going to be not these old, dirty jobs. It was going to be a whole new world based on skills and talent. And I'm a teacher by trade and I've spent my life in the skills sector, so I'm passionate about talent. But we heard, you know, you need to all go in and be computer programmers and so on and so forth. What we used to say is, look, that's really important and we need those people, and particularly the young minds, but they're going to graft their knowledge on traditional industries, to mining, to uh, manufacturing, to agriculture. And now I say to people when they say, well, the green economy, you know, there's going to be no more traditional industry. Well, you can't actually build six-star buildings without aluminium, cement and, uh, and steel, at least today. Now, what you will do is have to graft new technologies and new production cycles. So I hate it, frankly, when people pit each other against one another. It isn't about whether or not you should be supported. Of course you should platform should be there, the skills, the investment in education, which we've sadly dropped off, and it's the biggest productivity figure we could deliver to the world. But also, let's look at how we actually shore up the best of the traditional world we know that's going to be required for the next at least 50 or 100 years. And, uh, and where does the innovation replace that? You know, manufacturing always amazes me. People say, oh, you know, dirty manufacturing is dead. Well, to some extent it is. Even, uh, even uh, in the raw material sector, you go into a pot smelter now mm. or a, uh, a foundry and, frankly, you will find computers dominate right, most of, of the work. But, but, in fact, biomanufacturing is simply a translation of product or packaging or whatever it is into new products that are more sustainable. So that's where we need the innovation. But the workers will still be there along with the technology and along with the new industries you're going to create and, and, off the back of that innovation. One of the principal changes in the last 10 years in the way society operates in the West, at least, and I think all over the world, is that the people who rise to the top of these large organizations, business, labor, whatever it might be, are now looking over their shoulders and saying, what are the innovations of the future that I need to adapt to? And those innovations are going to come from young people. So increasingly, large organizations are saying, tell me who the young people are, who are our customers, how are the, what are our young people who are employees doing? What are our young people doing in terms of changing technology? So much greater than 50 years ago, these large organizations are now saying, tell us what the young people want to do. And this uh, World Economic Forum is adapting to that to some extent as well. 
used to be that everybody was invited to the World Economic Forum, and we were called, whatever we were called, then they came up with young global leaders, and you had to be um, under 40 for that. Now they have a new thing called new shakers, which are people under 30. Uh -huh. And probably next year they'll have something under 20. Uh -huh. um, and the people like us are the old shakers, I think, because we you know, are not that uh, robust anymore. But clearly the World Economic Forum, I think, recognizes this. And I think all corporations and unions and other organizations recognize that change is coming from people who are your age. And we are much more focused on your thoughts than we ever were. Uh, ben, did you have one capstone, and then we need to move on? We so only have about five I have more one, minutes. I have one line. Uh, you come from Egypt. Um, I think you don't have to wait for permission. And, and there's one thing that, that I think that is really the big change. In maybe in the past, it was asking, give me the platform, give me the tools. Today, it's just doing. Hmm. Which is what the free enterprise system is about, right? It, you don't have to ask permission. It creates competition, and you go out and build your enterprise, and you compete with the big guys. The, the places where we have tremendous youth unemployment, Spain, Greece, are places where the free enterprise system is not working as it should. Too much, too many of the services are clogged up because the incumbents are protected. That's what, in some sense, we need to change to give the youth a chance. Do we have another question there in the back? And then Joe, we'll come over here. I'm Joe Schoendorf. I am a partner with Axel Partners in Silicon Valley. I've spent 45 years there, the last 25 in venture. Uh, I don't like to say that venture capitalists create jobs. We don't. We provide money, and we provide mentoring, and we make a bet, we pick somebody, and we get behind them. A big issue has not been discussed up here. We're one of you know a couple of hundred venture firms. You go on our website today, axel.com, we probably have a hundred active companies that we have provided the funding and the mentoring for over the last three to five years. We post the jobs for all of those companies. I looked this morning, 1,577 jobs open, many of them paying six figures, most of them needing a degree of education and training that is in short supply in the United States. Now, we get into a political issue. We said, all right, give us green cards. We need to bring in engineers from other places. It got stopped in the US political system. But for that engineer who doesn't get hired, you all run companies with technical people. That's probably five or six other people who aren't getting hired that would get hired to support that engineer. And this is a real problem. If I'm one venture firm, and I probably invest in what, David, you'd say, you know, 0.1% or 1% of the market, and I've got 100 companies, and I've got 1,577 jobs, and most of them, you know, way, 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 way above minimum wage, many of them in six figures. Uh, and, and, and we've got a problem where our government is basically preventing the creation of those jobs, and we've got a training issue. We've got a trillion dollars in U.S. debt for people who have paid for college educations getting degrees where, one, they could be employed in this world if we had more engineers, or they should have gone out and tried to do something in the math and sciences. Big companies, the, the disruption rate of big companies is about to increase. We're going to lose a global brand this year. I mean, you all bought a Kodak film at some point in your life. The story you may not know is Kodak invented the digital camera. 1975, 0.1 megapixel. They took it to the board. The board said, oh, good idea, but please don't tell anybody about this. So that's true. We did. We talked a lot about competitiveness, but we didn't really, and we even might have mentioned training, but we didn't use the word education, I don't think, once. But well, that's a good point. Well, one of the scandals of the world and the undermining of productivity is the lack of investment in education yeah. and training. No question. And... But I want to also say that the venture capital model that you just heard described, it's not all like that, but is absolutely important to think through. What do they do? They actually support someone and they mentor them and they get those start-up companies to a point where they are self-sustaining. That is really good work because they create jobs. You're right, most of them are good jobs, etc. And I want to say that for the labour movement, part of what we bring to the table is $25 trillion of workers' capital our pension funds, mm -hmm. and 14 trillion of them are co-managed by labour leaders and business leaders. 
and that is part of lifting the, the, the burden of, of uh, government debt and indeed, of course, of creating productive investment. If, if we have more comments on this particular question, I th I'm afraid this is probably where we're going to have to leave it. So I'm sorry we won't have time for any more questions. And once we cap this out, um, we're going to have to end the session. Uh, John, it was too nice to, to – he's in a quiet period. But uh, one of his companies they invested in was a company called – you would have heard of uh, Facebook. I think you've heard of that. <laughs> Just a small uh, one. I'm sorry, Barry, did on, you – On the issue of education, I mean, that's clearly something that's very important. But of course, there's education and there's education. There's some education which doesn't get you anything in the workforce, uh, doesn't get you any pay, and there's some education, science, technology, engineering, math, which is very uh, crucial uh, in the United States, very important, and, and uh, we need more of that. It's easier said than done. I think changing education has been on every president's agenda since Gerald Ford, and we haven't really made an impact. I think it is something that we have to take a very close look at. I think President Obama is looking at it. But it is something that there is a lot of resistance to change from within the education industry. I belong to that industry. Uh, we would like to do more. We should do more. Uh, and hopefully we can do more. But it is clearly, in, in many ways, the central problem that we face. You know, one of the points that has been raised recently that's of concern to me in, in the Western uh, publications is that education is not a good thing. Increasingly, people are saying you don't need to get a college degree and you can do just as well without it. I think that is a very, very misleading thing, and if people believe that, they're going to be very disappointed. The better educated you are, the better you're going to be prepared for the 21st century, whatever form of capitalism we have. I think, I think, I think yeah. people confuse education and training, and those are two different concepts. And they're, they're both important. They're, they're, both they're both important, important, but they're two different concepts. And so affirming the importance of education. I think that we're going to have to Harmony. end it here. Um, I want to thank every, I want to thank the panelists for an incredibly engaging debate, which I think sets the tone for the rest of the week. I want to thank the audience on behalf of Time and World Economic Forum. Thank you, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of your week.